So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar today about VCCs and family offices. We thought that we should connect the wealth management world with the fund management world and explore a different perspective on how to utilize VCC as a very useful tool in your, in your toolbox. So firstly, a very quick hello to friends and friends of the industry. I see many in the audience. Uh, so in this virtual form, uh, I, I now understand how a DJ feels like, right? They're just saying hi in the air. So hello, everyone. Uh, today, we're very happy and very privileged to have this panel with us. Firstly, to thank Spencer from MAS for making time and showing us support despite his crazy schedule, right? In enabling more family officers to come to Singapore. Um, and of course, not to forget uh, the rest of our panelists who are each a specialist in their own field. Um, I will now invite each of you to make a self-introduction uh, before I introduce myself. Yeah, so uh, shall I start with Spencer? Hello, thanks very much, Valerie. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, I'm Spencer from the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Uh, for those of you uh, who know MES uh, more as a financial regulator and central bank, uh, we also have an industry development function, which is where I come from. Uh, my area of uh, focus is mainly on wealth management, and I'm looking forward to learning from our esteemed panelists uh, in the discussion today. Thank you, Spencer. And with that, I would like to also introduce uh, JD, who is managing partner of Raffles Family Office. Uh, fun fact about him is that he's actually, he's a Singaporean, but they first set up shop in Hong Kong. So to, that, to a large extent, this is homecoming. So JD? Yeah, thank you, Mallory. Hi, everyone. My name is JD. I'm the managing partner of Raffles Family Office. I'm based in Singapore. So like Mallory mentioned, we set up shop in Hong Kong in April 2016 and we came to Singapore in October 2018. So we are a multi-family office. We specialize in asset management, wealth management, and legacy planning. So we'll share more of the BCC later on. How do we use BCC as a tool for wealth management? Okay, thank you, JD. With that, it brings us to Martin. Uh, so I was trying very hard to introduce Martin for him, and he had a really long description, a very illustrious career. So I thought it's best for Martin to introduce himself. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. It's Martin here. Um, I'm principal at Solace Fiduciary Services. Uh, we're an independent directorship firm. Uh, we're, we're privately owned um, head offices in Singapore. We also have an office in Hong Kong. So we would sit as independent directors on the VCC itself. But I'll also be speaking as a service provider uh, as the chair of the uh, Singapore Fund Administrators Association to give um, some background on the, the service providers as well. Okay, thank you, Martin. And last but not least, uh, someone with an even longer career, even more illustrious is David, David, Mr. David Sanderson. And I again would invite him to do a self-introduction. Thank you, Valerie. Um, and yes, very, very kind for you to say I have an even more illustrious career than, uh, than young Martin there. Um, I've been in Singapore for, for, for 30 years and um, until I retired in 2014, I was effectively or had been set, uh, had set up and been running the fund management tax practice in a big four uh, accounting firm in Singapore. And I've seen the evolution of the fund management industry uh, in Singapore from 2002, when I think it was kicked off formally um, during the Economic Review Committee uh, to 2020, where it is now. So I've seen every shape and form of, uh, of, of incentive, of um, legal structure, et cetera, et cetera, regulatory changes um, on, their, on their way through. And, very pleased to be here today to um, to discuss what uh, should be the crowning achievement of all of this, which is the venture capital company. Yeah. In Thank fact, you. sorry, I mean the variable capital company. Sorry. It could be Thank used you, for David. venture capital as well. Well, it could have, yeah, yes, yeah. It could have been, yeah. Exactly. But not just venture capital, that's the point. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yes. And uh, then I guess a few brief words about myself. Uh, my name is Valerie Wu. Um, I have spent my time mostly as a lawyer, as tax lawyer throughout the past 20 years and a bit, 
The only two times I left practice, once was to join a fund management company. I was heading the legal team. And with that, the fun fact is, uh, that was 12 years ago. I traveled all the way to Luxembourg to set up a CCAF. And at that time, I was thinking to myself, we should have something like this in Singapore. So uh, 12 years later, we ha- I am part of the pilot program, set up one of the first 20 VCCs. And uh, we, have, we now have VCC in Singapore, and I'm very, very glad. Um, and of course, my other focus in my practice is private wealth, hence, uh, that, hence this particular theme today. Okay? So without further ado, I would love to then move us on to talk about the overview before I, I we start our panel discussion. Shall we, JD? Uh, Valerie, I think you also launched a poll, so you can see the poll. Oh yes, of course. Uh, some admin uh, announcements here. Number one, we have launched a poll, so please feel free to you know give us your input. Uh, we will review the answers about the poll at the end of the panel session, which is roughly maybe 4.40, 4.45. And the other point is that in terms of your questions, if you have any burning questions from now until the, throughout, please feel free to type it in and then we will address them live uh, at the end of our panel session. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's right. Okay. Okay. Uh, with that, I think we can talk about this. Yeah. Um, so I think most of us will be familiar by now. Uh, there's been a lot of press and judging from the number of webinars so far and the number of inquiries, VCC is definitely a game changer for our industry, uh, or in fact, not just industry, for our jurisdiction. So the pilot program was launched uh, 15 January this year, and there were 20 participants, of which one of the participants actually did all three at the same time. Um, when we say three at the same time, it's because uh, in that sense, it, it relates to the grant. Each fund manager can actually apply for the grant up to three times. So um, back to this uh, VCC, what is it all about? It can be a standalone fund, it can be an umbrella fund, so that's attractive. Uh, it can have both open-ended and closed-end funds under the same umbrella, so that's actually very versatile. There's great flexibility as well because it eliminates the limitation of other existing corporate structures. Uh, what we mean by that is uh, if it was a company, it's not so easy to subscribe and redeem constantly, whereas for this, given the variable capital structure, it is possible. Uh, and with that, I think I want to also go into the key features. There's segregation of uh, assets and liabilities vis-a-vis different sub-funds. So in terms of risk management or prevention of risk contagion, that's important. Uh, the issuance and redemption of shares uh, can be done without the prior shareholders' approval. Dividend distribution can be made out of capital, which gives flexibility for the fund managers. And inwards redominate, uh, redom of offshore funds are uh, very attractive. It's possible, uh, subject to criteria here. As we will discuss later, you'll see that actually sometimes the perspective is about how do you satisfy the criteria of the other jurisdiction to come out. Um, and the uh, flexibility, again, uh, as a standalone or umbrella structure. So today, uh, the panel that we have here uh, covers the different perspectives and service providers in this ecosystem. There are fund managers like uh, JD, there are fund and tax lawyers like myself, uh, fund administrators, or, although there is a wider perspective as a service provider, fund auditors, but in terms of someone like David, it also can be a tax advisor, and of course, corporate secretaries. Um, shall we move into the next slide? Yeah, uh, just a quick uh, statistic. As at 29 July, there are 94 VCCs registered. Considering that this was launched in January, that's quite a tremendous result. Uh, so that's why today we're thinking, is there room for further innovation, potentially? And uh, as of now, also an, uh, another point to mention the VCC, you can actually employ different uh, types of investment strategies. And so far, it's proven to be rather flexible. I think I've, so far, of the five sub funds that we're doing right now, all five have different investment strategies. And uh, there's a lot more that can be accommodated. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so now the theme of today, why the VCC for wealth management? Uh, traditionally, maybe the thought of VCC is that it sits with the fund management industry alone, but in fact, uh, given the themes and the wider context, the regulatory context, where there's economic substance requirements in other jurisdictions, uh, to name a few will be Cayman Islands, BVI, Bahamas, uh, this enables consolidation of the assets under one fund. And with that, you can actually achieve the economic substance and it can be truly satisfied. So that's actually a useful fact. Uh, the second point that we want to also mention at the outset is that the tax incentive that you can obtain at the umbrella level, it percolates and applies to all the sub funds. So 
So you literally switch on each time, uh, subject to the investment strategy. And the third point is what we have highlighted earlier as well. The segregation of the assets and liabilities can be useful. And let's say in the context of succession planning, uh, if you have two branches or three branches of the family, each of them can have their own sub fund, for example. Or if you have different siblings, maybe each of them can have their own sub fund. Or you could divide it by the character of assets. So it's quite useful in that regard. Uh, and of course, back to the tax treaty benefits, if, you, uh, if one applies for the tax incentive at the umbrella level, uh, potentially the tax treaty benefits can be enjoyed by the VCC, given that by its own fundamental nature, it's actually a company uh, and is actually regulated by ACRA. Uh, and last and not least, of course, the strong support by the regulator through the VCC grant scheme that is supposed to run for three years from 15 January this year. I have the next slide, please. Um, that brings me then straight into the overview where I wanted to pose uh, one of our burning questions to uh, Spencer, which is uh, what is the landscape like right now uh, in terms of family offices being set up in Singapore? Right. Uh, thanks so much, Valerie. I think, um, uh, as you mentioned, you know, there's been very strong interest in, in the establishment of family offices in Singapore uh, in the past few years, especially. Uh, mainly driven by the growth in number of um, uh, billionaire uh, families uh, in the region and also given that they're at a point of their uh, intergenerational wealth transfer. So I think um, many of them find the family office as a very useful structure uh, for them to consolidate their assets uh, and also to groom the next generation uh, to get them familiar with the uh, wealth management uh, aspects of, of the family. Uh, and in, in the past uh, two years, between 2017 to 2019, uh, we've seen the number of family offices grow by around five times uh, during that period, which is uh, actually quite uh, phenomenal uh, for us. And I think uh, the trend is expected to continue. I think uh, some may, may, may think that uh, because of COVID-19, uh, there may have been a slowdown in interest because of you know, the inability to travel or the, the lack of a contact with the advisors. But I think based on, you know, what we have been seeing so far, because uh, my team actually processes the uh, 13X and R uh, incentive applications for family offices, we have only seen the, the number of applications, you know, go up in the past uh, few months. So I think based on what we're seeing, uh, there has been a strong interest in, in setting up uh, family offices in Singapore. And it's not just uh, limited to families uh, within uh, the, the eight or the Southeast Asia uh, region. I think we're seeing a strong interest coming from uh, North Asia, uh, Europe, and even the US uh, who are looking to explore uh, opportunities that Asia offers. So I think, um, you know, we're seeing very strong uh, trends over here and uh, the VCC uh, would prove to be a useful vehicle for families who want to uh, you know, leverage it for their wealth management purposes. Thank you very much, um, Spencer. So actually, uh, currently, as we know, VCCs, technically only the multi-family officers who are themselves therefore licensed uh, are able to uh, utilize or set up the VCC. So any thoughts regarding the SFOs? Right. Um, actually, um, I, I would say that uh, uh, um, Beyond, um, I mean, technically, the whole list of uh, qualifying institutions would uh, include any uh, uh, fund manager, whether licensed, uh, registered, or exempt fund managers uh, in, in Singapore, which could include uh, some of the other MAS licensed financial institutions, would be able to set up and manage a VCC uh, you know, for their clients. Um, with regard to single family offices, uh, because they are exempted from uh, licensing requirements in Singapore uh, by virtue that uh, they are managing their own assets. Uh, there is currently still a restriction uh, that prevents uh, single family offices from doing so. And I think this is uh, very much a manifestation of uh, the, the Singapore government's approach of, you know, trying to be sure that, you know, the, any vehicle that is introduced is, is safe and subject to the subjected to the highest requirements, uh, especially in, in terms of uh, anti money laundering uh, perspective. Uh, and hence, there was this uh, initial um, restriction on uh, single family offices uh, running uh, the VCC. But um, uh, as with the proactive uh, approach that we have adopted, 
uh, even before the launch uh, of the vehicle itself, we have already been exploring uh, how we could also allow single family offices to manage VCC uh, in, a, in a safe and prudent manner. So this is definitely uh, something that's in the works for us. That's actually very exciting. But in the meantime, I guess for anyone who wants to set up a VCC, they will have to work with fund managers for now, uh, especially for those who are SFOs. And uh, I guess with that, thank you, Spencer. I'm going to uh, move on to JD. Uh, in terms of your participation, uh, RIFO's participation in the pilot program, uh, what are your thoughts, you know, as a fund manager in Singapore? Thank you, Hilary. JD, I think you need to, I think, either turn on your mic or something. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, I can hear you now. Earlier, I think there were a few bits that we probably couldn't hear. Yeah. Okay. It might be the connection. Okay. Yeah, so that's what I was saying that we are honored because it's a recognition from the industry. And being in the pilot program gives us the heads up because we get to launch the VCC earlier. And as mentioned by Valerie just now, VCC was launched on the 15th of January this year. And if you recall, the COVID-19 hit shortly after. So I would say that the MAS and the ATA are very efficient in the answering to our questions and in terms of delivering certain aspects of the, the launch. And due to the disruption caused by the COVID-19, certain timeline could not be met and time extensions Time extensions was given as well, and I'm sure the entire fund management industry in Singapore, they are appreciative of that. So, yeah, gener generally very positive experience. Thank you, JD. Uh, and six months in, as of now, what do you think? Uh, do you have any thoughts? And uh, I, I'm sure it has only created more opportunities for yourselves, but we would love to hear from you in terms of your further thoughts about this. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, uh, just now you mentioned that 94 VCCs have been established as of 29th of, April, 29th of July. So I feel that the take-up rate is very remarkable, especially in today's climate. And VCC only started about seven months ago. So as I mentioned, Singapore is uh, already widely regarded as the most stable, well-run investment center. So when they think of Singapore, they think of uh, things like political st stability, they think of a uh, transparent economy, they think of the, the efficiency. So while all these attributes have served Singapore well, it was still missing something of a flexible investment structure, the VCC. And with the introduction, introduction of the VCC, it will propel Singapore into a global investment scene as a true competitor to the likes of Cayman, which is a very popular uh, the Cayman SPC is a very popular new structure in the past here in Asia. So as a matter of fact, the such vehicle exists in other jurisdictions. So like you said, the CCAF in Luxembourg, like the SPC in Cayman, as well as in Hong Kong, they have the OFC. So this is not a new vehicle. And although Singapore can be considered a little bit late to the game, but having said that, I believe that this can turn out into an advantage because Singapore, Singapore can use the lessons learned by, uh, can learn the lessons of all these different other countries and use that to our advantage. And at the same time, MAS and the ACRA, they have spent seven years to develop this. And I'm sure that they have uh, put careful considerations into it before setting up this structure. And I strongly believe that this will propel Singapore to the next level. That's excellent news for many of us. Uh, I, because I think in the end, what we really want is for more uh, structures, more family or more family offices to use Singapore as a jurisdiction, right? So that the entire ecosystem can benefit. So yeah. as a multi-family office as of now, uh, how does RFO envisage the use of BCC as an alternative investment structure for family offices? Yeah, so for us at, at Raffles Family Office, we wear multiple hats. So as a multi-family office, our main role is to act as a gatekeeper for our clients. So our function is independent of the banks and brokers, which means that we stand on our client side. 
So as a multifamily office, we represent our client. So we are able to consolidate and manage the entire pool of our client's assets holistically and more efficiently. So this allows us to have a different asset allocation and design structures to provide the maximum value to each clients or each families. So this is what we mean by creating true values for our companies, for our clients and for our people. So in relation to the VCC, so RFO, we are the licensed fund manager. So we believe the VCC can act as a wonderful complement to the existing platform the, that we have in place. So as mentioned earlier, so uh, one of the major benefit of the VCC is the flexibility. So the VCC can be structured in a number of ways depending on the needs of the fund and the investors. So you can set up as an umbrella fund. So you can allow the both consolidation as well as the segregation of assets and liability under one single legal entity. So for instance, one of our clients is uh, the family assets can be consolidated on the umbrella level and divided into various sub funds for the management of different family members through uh, or through different investment strategies. So in the past, under the Singapore Companies Act, so the, the, the structures that we were more familiar with are the limited partnerships, the unit trust or the private limited companies. So many of the restrictions, such as the redemption of capital, the publicly available um, of a shareholder list, yeah. the payment of dividend only from profit, just to name a few, all these have been eliminate, eliminated under the new VCC framework. So this will allow for greater flexibility and additional structuring option for investors looking to domicile their funds in Singapore. Yeah, yeah and, Singapore, and VCC is a very flexible structure, so it allows for a wide range of investment products. This can be really by design to allow fund managers to have greater room to maneuver. So for example, like you mentioned, both the open and closed the traditional or alternative investments can be all launched through the use of the VCC. And previously, the sub-fund structure with different investment strategies was not possible. And fund managers have to separately set up a brand new fund for each strategy. So that being said, investor protection is also one of the key concerns in wealth management. So the segregation of uh, asset and liability under the one VCC Act is critical here. Yeah. And in wealth management, investors definitely devalue the privacies very importantly. You wouldn't want to let everyone know so like what, what you've got, right? So the VCC register of shareholders will not be made public to the will not, will not be made public on the APRA website. And the VCC share capital is always equal to the net asset value. And they also measure the, the assets and liability at fair value at every point in time. And therefore, distribution can be made out of profit or out of capital, depending on the situation, on how you draft the your your constitution and you're able to issue and redeem shares at the NAV. So it gives the investors the easy entry and exit from their investments. Yeah. Yeah. So I believe I covered the more of the, the how we can use the VCC as a structure. Uh, most importantly, the VCC is a single regular company in Singapore. So that will give access to the double taxation agreements that Singapore enjoys currently with with 80 over different countries in the world. And as Spencer mentioned just, just now, on the umbrella level, you can apply for the 13R or the 13X tax incentive, and all the sub funds will be entitled to this tax benefit. Yeah. So tremendous list of advantages for VCC. Uh, I guess I won't be uh, doing justice to the trust industry or the wealth management industry if I don't compare and contrast now to a trust. Uh, let's say if you had a discretionary trust and uh, you reserve the power investment to the set law, uh, and if you compare this to a VCC, what are the advantages or what are the disadvantages? If I'm a service provider, I'm a licensed entity, uh, the VCC actually helps you with that risk management per se. Uh, because any of these, um, as long as you can, the fund manager is willing to take on that and then have a cogent investment strategy, it can be housed under that sub fund uh, as opposed to having it under a trust. Uh, so that's just one of the headline things that I can think about as of now. Uh, and then with that, I want to move us back uh, into the perspective of uh, what are the service providers, uh, what are their thoughts in setting this up. So Martin, 
in your capacity as chair of the Fund Administration Association, can you tell us your thoughts or what to expect from fund admin of a VCC? Is it any different or is it the same or what should we be expecting? Uh, well, the first thing, um, there's a lot of excitement within the community on the service provider side with VCC. Mm -hmm. um, look, there's a lot of bad news globally. There's a, a, a lot of noise with Cayman and, and other jurisdictions, right? So. I guess the silver lining in the current climate is VCC, right? So us as, as a director and as, as members of association, you know, with 94 launches, that, that's, that's excellent news for the service provider community. Um, so I guess with, with a family office historically, they may not have used independent service providers. They might've done stuff in-house or, you know, they might not be, too familiar with a fund administrator. But as part of the VCC, there is transparency requirements, there's government requirement, governance requirements, and there's also reporting requirements on the VCC itself. So, so as a family office, if you're not familiar with fund administrators and independent directors and so forth, then you know, you're gonna to have to become somewhat familiar with them if you're using a VCC. So, uh, so the first thing is, under VCC, um, you, you don't have, so it's, it's an onshore fund, so therefore there'll be onshore providers. Um, with a VCC, you don't need a Singapore-based administrator unless you're going for tax incentives. But in reality, all VCCs will be going for tax incentives, so therefore... I was going to say. <laughs> so I don't think there'll be any VCCs not going for tax incentives. So... So in reality, uh, you will have to appoint a Singapore-based fund administrator for 13R and 13X. So, so th that's the first thing. So you would have to engage with an administrator for that. Um, so then we get, uh, we're getting questions around things like uh, the constitution, uh, performance fees, open-ended, closed-ended, things like that. Um, so the, the VCC, and what we mentioned earlier, and JD mentioned about the flexibility of it, it can be open-ended or closed-ended, it can be standalone, it can be umbrella, it can be, you know, sub-funds, etc. Uh, very similar to Cayman and other jurisdictions. Um, there's some confusion about the performance fees on the VCC. Um, so the constitution is flexible enough to allow equalization and series. Now, a lot of people are thinking that you can only do series accounting within the VCC itself, Well, that's not true. Um, you can have equalization and series uh, methodology within there. Uh, I guess the only difference between Cayman and, and VCC is, is that series have to be issued at NAV, not on a power amount each month of $100 or, or $1,000, et cetera. So, so, so you know, it, it, it's meant to be flexible and you define your offering within the constitution and also the performance fee calculations within that as well. So it's flexible to cover for both. Um, so other things, other things uh, within that, um, that maybe family offices look, should look out for is, is the, you can outsource functions to a fund administrator. Um, so, so the, AML process, so the collection of documents, the processing of documents uh, can be done by the fund administrator as well. Um, the, the, the regulated entity is ultimately responsible for AML, but the administrator can do a lot of work. Uh, At the on, operational level, I guess, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and then maybe when you're looking at sourcing a fund administrator um, and which administrator you pick, I mean, apart from them being set up in Singapore and having a, an establishment in Singapore, um, looking at their capabilities for hedge funds, looking at their capabilities for private equity, looking at their private, private equity capabilities as well. So, um, so for family offices, it might be a new concept, but they're, they're, you know, Singapore has a, a, a very large talent pool for fund administrators. As an association, we're tracking 31 administrators right now. Um, and that's from very large to very small. So there is a very strong talent pool uh, and, 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 and Singapore as a processing center in Asia is, is quite large as well. So, um, you know, so, so 
it, it, it for some family offices it, it could be something new but you know just to rest assured that there's a large community and a large talent pool of, of providers to pick from so um, I think that's probably from the file administration side that's reassuring. Uh, I also wanted to mention that, I mean, in the course of the many uh, applications that we made on behalf of clients for 13X and 13R, uh, there have been times where the clients will say, oh, you know, actually I have my own people. Why do I need a fund administrator? And uh, if we do ever want to apply for a waiver, we actually have to justify why. And I mean, from the wider perspective, of course, we should make sure that our service providers in Singapore get the benefit from <laughs> whether setting up a family office in Singapore or setting up a VCC in Singapore. So uh, I think that there's a lot more scope for fund administrators in, to, to play uh, yeah. from now on. Yeah, and maybe just add, in Singapore, it's not a regulated activity yet. Yep. Uh, in other jurisdictions, Luxembourg, Dublin, which are probably uh, you know, a longer track record and a little bit more established, um, it is regulated there. But we are looking, and we've been speaking with the MAS as an association, we're looking at about three years' time. Um, so that the service providers that engage with a VCC can also be regulated as well. So that's good for everybody. It, it, yes, there, you know, and I think that's part of our looking to the future part as well. Yes, yes, yes. So, so, so it's good news for the administrators. Um, it, it, it really puts a line in the sand with the service offering and, and the capabilities of the provider itself. Okay. Thanks, Martin. With that, it brings me to David. Um, who, want, who will be able to help us um, solve the mystery or what to expect in the first fund audit since no one has done it before for a VCC yet. We're only six months old. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Valerie. Um, <clears throat> and just, just before I answer this, I, I, I do have to preface it by saying I'm not personally an auditor myself, but because I'm representing a firm that provides audit services uh, as well as tax services and other, um, I'm going to give it my best shot, but of course, obviously, the um, you know if 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 anyone needs follow up and in depth advice, then we have plenty of that in spades available. But here's how I see what you should expect from your first VCC audit, and what I'm doing here is uh, pretending that you have already. Um, perhaps had fund audits in the past that you may have experienced them uh, somewhere else. And the real question is around whether this is going to be any different from what you might have experienced before. Yes. My short answer is um, I don't believe that it will be any different um, for, um, for a couple of reasons. Because if you think of what a fund is, it's really just a piece of paper and the things that make it work are the people that go around it. So you've got a bunch of investors, you've got um, a bunch of funds that need investing, that get pulled in the fund that need investing, and they're effectively handed over to the safekeeping and guidance of the fund manager and the, and the fund administrator. So any audit will be built around ensuring uh, that these people, first of all, are doing what they say on the tin they're supposed to be supposed to be doing, uh, and and checking that there are adequate systems of control in place to make sure that these people are more likely than not doing what they are supposed to be doing, for the purposes, largely of safeguarding the assets of of the investors. Uh, and so with, within that backdrop, um, there really isn't much else that would be required in relation specifically to a VCC. Obviously, you're still going to have uh, all the custody issues to make sure the assets are probably look, properly looked after, their, their, uh, their, their safekeeping is secured, uh, the valuation of the assets is, is appropriate and, and checked off, and that the assets actually exist. So all of these things are what you would expect to find in, in any fund situation. And the box that you put around it, which is the shape of the fund, whether it be a limited partnership, a, corp, a company, a VCC, or anything else, uh, only affects it to the extent that there may be differences in the corporate governance. But that's more of, a, of, of, an, ex, of an exoskeletal 
thing rather than what we're talking about on an audit, which is the software and the, and the operations and the recording of, of transactions. So the short answer to that is I, I don't see any major changes. Uh, however, one of the, the benefits of the Singapore VCC, uh, because if you were looking for segregated cells and something that was a bit flexible in terms of returning capital, uh, the Cayman Islands was the popular alternative. Well, of course, if you bring everything into Singapore, uh, then you also dispense with the need for a second audit in the Cayman Islands, which was always just another layer of cost. So cost savings, certainly on the audit side, by bringing, uh, bringing everything in into Singapore. Um, two types of structure you can have within the VCC, you can have a single, um, a single cell VCC, or you can have the umbrella cell VCC, which has got all the sub funds sitting underneath it. Well, again, uh, looking at the software that goes around this, we are simply looking from an audit perspective of testing those same systems of control, custody, valuation, reporting, etc., etc. But you do it on a sub-fund by sub-fund basis and report accordingly to each sub-funds. Now, we know that the, the VCC is a single legal entity um, and we know that there is talk about consolidating the, uh, the sub-funds, but that isn't actually what happens. It's not a consolidation as we would have learned at, at, uh, during our professional exams, uh, where we've got a single set of, of shareholders and we've got minority interests, et cetera, et cetera. What we, what we have in the situation uh, here is simply a collection of single legal entities with effectively uh, little microcosms and environments of their own. So when these things are presented to ACRA, essentially ACRA is just getting what we'd call an aggregation of these, um, these, these separate cells, uh, not a consolidation in the, in the traditional way that we'd think about it. So you could even say that the aggregation or consolidation uh, means that there is, is a smaller step to go through than a situation where you've got a private equity fund that may have a whole raft of subsidiaries that need consolidating, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so again, uh, going back to the, to the answer to the question, it doesn't look from where we're standing at the moment that there is going to be major disruption. In terms of the accounting standards um, that can be applied, we can do FRS, we can do IFRS, and there's very little between the two of those, and, and US GAAP. So again, uh, quite a choice sitting out there. So I think you'll find uh, guys who are those who either have a VCC or, or are thinking of setting one up, they're not gonna notice any more, uh, more trouble from the auditors uh, and the questions are going to be no more or less aggravating than you would normally expect. And of course, aggravating questions are often the ones that um, hit the mark. So, um, yeah, so that is my overview on where the audit would take us. Thank you very much, David. Uh, so basically, it's back to first principles in that sense. Um, with that, I wanted to bring us to the next topic of tax and tax incentives. Um, I guess I will start with Spencer. Uh, is there any difference uh, in the process when it comes to the application for whether 13X or 13R if you were presented with a VCC vis-a-vis -a, -vis a family office? Right. Um, I think uh, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the, the 13X and R process, um, I, I don't think there would be a uh, a significant difference in, in terms of the treatment of uh, a VCC when it comes to applying for the incentives. And I think the, the, the incentive of the incentive is that uh, it, using a VCC <laughs> nice you know, is treated as a single, uh, a single tax entity. So uh, yeah. it, it actually, you know, it, it's, it's more streamlined and process. 
uh, I, I speak more from the angle of uh, uh, 13X application, 13X and R applications for uh, single family offices. But I believe uh, it would be the same when it comes for uh, you know uh, application from the perspective of uh, uh, fund managed by a regulated entity. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, on top of that, and you've also mentioned in your your earlier sharing is that uh, there is an additional uh, grant scheme which uh, uh, the MAS is actually giving out uh, for a period of three years uh, for the establishment of uh, VCCs, and this goes towards uh, the legal uh, as well as uh, you know some of the establishment costs that are attribute attributable to. Uh, tax as well as uh, uh, fund administrators. So the, you know the whole whole suite of service providers that are necessary for the establishment of uh, VCC will will benefit from uh, this grant, which is uh, awarded to the applicant, which is the um, entity that is setting up uh, the fund itself. Also add on, uh, as you said, the incentive of the incentive, right? Uh, it, since it's more streamlined, I mean, technically, if previously under uh, a family office situation, if I had two different funds under a family office, I could be making two different applications for 213 access, let's say. But uh, now, I mean, in contrast, if I have a VCC and I have two sub funds, uh, I'm applying for 113x at the umbrella level. So in terms of your annual expenses of 200,000, let's say uh, you're doing one set. But of course, uh, it's a question of whether it's suitable and appropriate for your family's uh, succession planning purposes or asset management purposes. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if JD wanted to add any, your perspective about this as well, the difference between the VCC and the family office from your point of view. Yeah, so I believe that um, first we have to uh, define what is the, the family office here. I think family office is a very misused word here in the in a certain context. So we say yes. that as a family office, we represent the family. We are employed by the families to represent them. So VCC is a structure that we can employ and use to help them in terms of the private wealth management or consolidation of wealth management or using as a tiered structure. So these are the, the flexibility that the VCC allows for family offices. Okay. Sorry, uh, Valerie, could I just throw something in there as well on the tax side? Um, yes. well, one, of the, one of the things we find with clients, it's not, not just the $200,000 annual spend, but in thir with 13X, as you know, uh, you've got to have a fund size of 50 million single dollars. Yeah, which means that if you're, if you're setting up two funds um, to cater for two groups of investors, or two asset classes, uh, you'd have to have a hundred. You'd, you'd have to knock up a hundred million of investment. Whereas if we put them together in the VCC, then you only need fifty million, and you can split that twenty-five, twenty-five, or however you want between those. Or maybe those two branches of the family. Those, yeah. Well, that's that's right. Yes, yes. So you, yeah, you could have some that are interested in real estate, some that are in, interested in uh, you know private equity. Yeah. Et cetera, et cetera. And so you can split it up that way rather than having two separate funds where you've got to scrape together 50 million from each. Um, yeah. you, can, you can break it and down. And definitely that's, cost that's efficiencies. Big, yeah. yeah, that's quite a big draw, I think, for some people who are just not quite getting there with, with one of their funds. Yes, indeed. Thank you, David. Um, I am mindful of the time. I have another question about directorship that I want to quickly ask JD. What should one ex expect as a director of the VCC from the governance point of view? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, I have to say that I'm wearing two hats. So I'm also, I'm the director of the reference family office as well as the director of the VCC. So I'm in the holder. I am the holder of the management share of the VCC and RFO is the licensed fund manager of the VCC. So in relation to your question, Valerie, the governance expect according to the VCC Act, so for the potential liability of the VCC that are not attributed to the any of the sub fund, the VCC directors may allocate the liability, liabilities between the sub funds as long as the allocation is fair to the shareholder. So having said that, in relation to the potential liability of the VCC directors, we will highlight that um, me, 
myself as well as RFO are acting on multiple capacities, capacities. So accordingly, any risk involved to the VCC or its sub funds will depend on the which capacity of myself am I am I um, included in. So yeah. such liability are incurred. So that is the, the critical part here that we were discussing about previously. Yeah. And I guess the other point that I may want to highlight as well is that this is in relation to the proprietary fund that you've set up for yourself uh, for Raffles Family Office. So had it been a client who set up a sub fund or had it been a client who created a VCC but want yourself to act as the licensed fund manager, they can be a director of that VCC, but you are actually uh, acting as the licensed fund manager and you happen to be a director of the licensed fund manager. Right, so I, I think that's something to distinguish. And with that, I also wanted to ask Martin for your perspective as an independent director. Could you share your thoughts as well? Yeah. So, so as we mentioned previously, um, the licensed manager can be the only director, or, or, or a qualified individual from the manager can be the only director on the VCC. Yeah. There's advantages and disadvantages to that. So, with family offices, they may or may not have run fund vehicles before. So as it's an onshore fund, uh, management and control sits in Singapore and, and the board of directors need to oversee that management control in Singapore itself. So if you're a family office and you haven't um, run a fund vehicle before, uh, or if you have, you might have used a Cayman vehicle, which is very much a hands-off, pretty much a hands-off and you delegate the Cayman you may not have much of a track record with dealing with governance as well. So, you know, running board meetings um, on, on, on a quarterly or semi-annual basis. Um, the directors also have to deal with things like conflicts of interest, um, you know, inspections, AML, CFT. So depending on, on, on the family office, if they've not run a fund before, uh, an independent director can be useful to help them guide them through the VCC process. So it's, and also if it's, if it's your proprietary money, it's fine. But if you start looking for third party money, yep. you, know, you know, there will be the conflict of interest issue. If, if you're the only director, the, your investors may require you to have independent directors as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think with that, it brings me to, I guess, uh, there are many funds uh, and based on the inquiries from my own observation, they are actually domiciled in Cayman uh, Islands and they are looking to potentially re-domicile in Singapore. So I think that we have two questions that we may want to address. I mean, just open to all our panelists. Um, what would be the advantage of VCC vis-a-vis -vis SPC in Cayman Islands? And then, you know, if one were to re-domicile, do we do it new or do we re-domicile? Um, who wants to go first? Or maybe Martin? To follow uh, up where you left off? Yeah. If, if, if to go in reverse order with Redom versus a new setup, I think we had a couple of clients who went down the Redom affiliation route and found out that it, it takes a lot longer than anticipated. You have to get a clearance certificate from the other jurisdiction. Yeah. I think it's mostly Cayman Islands, to be fair. but. I think people underestimated the time. To, so there was no issue on the Singapore side. The issue was on the Cayman side, um, getting the clearance from, from Cayman. If you throw COVID into the mix with, you know, restricted resources in the authorities, then it's taken a lot of time. So the client I have is three funds in Cayman. They redumbed one and they're actually winding down the other one and doing um, an in-kind or an in-species transfer from the wind down into the VCC itself. Yeah, I, I was going to mention that actually from my observation as well, uh, the criteria to satisfy here, whether it's solvency or liquidity is usually pretty straightforward. Uh, it's the exit from the other jurisdiction that takes time. And I think right now, one of the options that we are exploring for the client is actually uh, just wind down that fund given that it's a private family one. Uh, yeah. and then uh, bring the capital in, put it into a new VCC. It might be faster and more streamlined as yeah. well. Yeah, uh, that, that's what we're seeing as well. It depends, you know, if, if you want to bring the track record and, and maintain the consistency and, and accounting, yeah. but yeah, it, it's, it takes a lot longer than people anticipate. Yeah. Um, I throw something in on the tax side. <clears throat> of course, there. David. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I think from, from, from a tax perspective, once you've re-domiciled the fund, then it's pretty much business as, as usual because, um, you know, assuming you've got the tax incentives in place, et cetera, et cetera, um, we're, we're off to the races. The, the benefit of re-domiciling as opposed to closing a fund and bringing assets into a new fund in Singapore is, of course, all the transaction costs that there would be from closing down the existing fund. Uh, transaction costs, potential capital gains, tax, et cetera, et cetera. So technically, just moving the domicile shouldn't trigger any of those, uh, any of those tax exposures in other countries if, for example, you've got a you know, private equity fund, real estate fund, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I guess as of now, we don't have probably not yet uh, having to discuss about the re domiciled funds applying for tax incentive scheme or maybe it's soon. It's I think. early, yeah. Yeah. Shall we go into, I mean, if there's no further thoughts about this, maybe we'll go into q and I'm just mindful that it's already 4.55 and we probably can uh, address some of the questions and the rest that we can't address in time, we will swing back and reply via email uh, in that sense, if we can, as far as we can. Yeah, sounds okay. good. Okay, uh, Sean, where are the questions? It's on the webinar chat, the Zoom chat. Okay. Okay, I see. Okay, there's a question for JD there. Shall we say that? If we will be to, if we are to set up a VCC, what's the detailed collaboration between VCC and the licensed uh, family office or a LFMC? I guess it's a RFMC nowadays. All L is licensed or registered. Yeah. So, uh, I'm not sure. If, okay, in order to set up a VCC, you have to be a licensed uh, fund manager in Singapore. So. Um, if let's say if you're a single family office currently at the mo at this moment you're not allowed to set up a VCC, so you have to partner with a licensed fund manager like Raffles, and Raffles will be the the fund manager and host the directorship of the VCC. And if let's say this this uh person that asked the question they wanted to set up the the collaboration will be Raffles will be the licensed fund manager and they will have um perhaps a sub-management agreement, sub-management mandate according to the, their investment strategy. And this is the, the kind of agreement that we have with the sub-manager. So they will be the sub-manager and will be the fund manager. They could be the advisor too, right, JD? I guess. Yeah, they, yeah so you, or you can say that they can be the advisor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then the next question here for Spencer. Any take about transforming a private limited structure, I guess that means a company, uh, with 13X into a VCC umbrella with 13X? Transforming. Oh, okay. Transforming <laughs> a company. Um, I think this is, this is uh, probably something very attractive to, uh, attractive to uh, some you know, fund uh, entities which are structured as, as a company structure at this point in yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, it's also uh, a feedback that we have received uh, in, in copious amounts and uh, also an area that uh, we are looking into, uh, uh, including under the uh, revisions to the VCC legislation. So uh, I would ask for, for patience on this front. I think um, you know, at the onset, we've uh, hit on the, the key uh, important elements of it. Um, the next phase of which is for us to actually work in uh, the details that will make it even more attractive. And I think on this front, we also, um, you know, welcome any feedback that um, anyone from the industry has uh, with regard to the structure. Uh, it, it's still good time now to put in these uh, suggestions and we can uh, work them into the next version of the VCC legislation. That sounds uh, very exciting. So we have at least two possibilities, two things to look forward to in the next uh, version of the VCC update. Okay, and the next question is for David. What is What are the protocols for transfer of interest shares in VCC and the differences as opposed to transfer of interest in Cayman uh, LP structure? That's, okay, so we go on the first part. Um, yeah, <clears throat> so the, diff the difference should be that if um, on the basis that shares in a VCC are 
similar to shares in any other company, then they would attract stamp duty if they were being transferred. Whereas if you're transferring your, your shares or units in a, an SPC in the Cayman, that, uh, that wouldn't be the case. Um, I would suspect though that actually transferring shares is, is going to be quite uncommon. Typically what will happen in the VCC because of its very nature of, of having a, a living, breathing share capital is that you're more likely to have um, you know, it, issues of shares and, and redemptions. Um, the issue of shares doesn't uh, cause any stamp duty in Singapore, the redemption of, of shares, the jury could still be out on that one as to whether there is a stamp duty arising on the redemption. Obviously, it's to be hoped um, that, that this isn't going to be the case and that it would only, stamp duty would only be invoked in the case of um, anti-avoidance provisions, um, whereby instead of doing a transfer, you're doing a, a, an issue followed by a redemption. And so you yeah. sort of round, round tripping it. Okay. That's where we are on the stamp duty. Okay. And uh, one question for Martin here. How is the VCC, how would it compare with OFC in Hong Kong or LP in Hong Kong, the regime? Well, I guess the first thing is one is in Singapore, one is in Hong Kong, obviously. So different, <laughs> different locations. But two... I guess, <laughs> I, guess, I guess the advantage of the VCC is it can be open-ended and closed-ended, whereas in Hong Kong, you have to pick one or the other, right? So OFC right, yeah. is for open-ended funds and LP is for closed-ended funds. So the beauty of the VCC is it can be both. And under VCC, you can do both in the same vehicle if you wish. Now, there are complexities with that. So... You know, you could have under VCC, you can tick both boxes. In Hong Kong, you cannot. Um, and also, there's still a lot of ambiguity about the tax situation on the OFC and, and LP in Hong Kong. And, you know, the, the Cayman lawyers are, are sort of tearing strips out of the LP legislation as well, saying it doesn't stack up the Cayman. So I think the flexibility of VCC versus OFC and LP is one thing. And then um, sort of the marketability and the distribution of OFC and LP is really centered around Hong Kong and, and, and North Asia. VCC, um, you know, you, you can't distribute it in LP under the passporting regime. You can distribute an OFC, but not an LP. And, you know, in the long-term play for distribution, VCC is a lot more attractive. So, you know, that, that's probably some of the comparisons. Thank you, Martin. And uh, I do have to address the question that was directed at me as well, which was, Valerie, can you elaborate how the sub fund of the VCC can be used in place of discretionary trust? Okay, uh, I think in brief, what I'm saying is that we now don't have to make the trust do everything that it sometimes cannot do. So the trust can truly be a succession planning uh, tool. And then any families that want to do their active investment management can now utilize the VCC, which is what it's meant for, to do your active investment through the investment strategy. So in that sense, you, your objectives can be um, achieved by two different tools as opposed to putting it all in one, uh, as we sometimes see in the industry. Yeah. Uh, I also wanted, uh, I'm mindful of the time in case uh, you have just, uh, our audience committed just one hour to ourselves. Uh, we want to go into the poll results now, which I'm trying to pull out. How do I get to the poll? <laughs> Oh, I see it now. Sorry. Uh, IT challenge person that I am. Okay. Um, how likely will we be using the VCC in the next 12 months? 28% says very likely. 59% maybe thinking about it. Um, well, 17% said, have you had got a coin? <laughs> okay. Um, how likely would you be using VCC versus Cayman SPC? Okay. I suppose the question we should have said uh, versus some other jurisdiction, but yes. Uh, so very likely is 38%. Maybe thinking about it is 47%. And the third one is maybe sitting on the fence, 16%, don't know. Uh, question three, what is your most, uh, your top most wish list really? 
Um, that's a tie. Okay, no. SFOs to qualify as permissible fund managers, 44%. More clarity on delegation of sub-management, 45%. Streamlining sub-fund registration, 46%. Okay, this one is an equal across. Huh? So we, it means that we have a very diverse audience today. Everyone has very focused perspective about this. So number four, which of the following features do you find most useful in using VCC for wealth management purposes? Asset aggregation, 52%. Economies of scale, 38%. Demonstrating substance, 30%. Variability of the capital, 37%. Yeah. So it's, it's always fun to take this straw poll to see how the audience feels as at now is a you know, freeze frame moment uh, because things can change. And then if there are further updates to the VCC, I think the poll will change as well, of course. Um, I, with that, I also want to thank, firstly, the panelists of your specialist perspective and Spencer, JD, Martin, and David, thank you very much today. Uh, I wonder if uh, JD want to uh, have some concluding remarks uh, since you're hosting this on your platform. Yeah, so uh, everyone for attending and thank you to the fellow panelists as well as and Valerie as a moderator. So we have uh, other questions here as well that we are unable to answer, but we will send you everyone an email before the end of this week and together with the webinar, the recording as well. So do look out for your email and we'll be sending them shortly before the end of this week. That's it for me. Okay. Um, any other concluding remarks from my wonderful panelists? Spencer? Starting with Spencer? Well, I, I thank you again, uh, you know, JD and uh, Valerie for your kind invitation. I think it's been uh, very illuminating for me as well, uh, learning about the, the technical aspects of the VCC. And uh, we look forward to a, a day where I can deepen this learning further. Thank you, Spencer. Martin? Uh, no, just thanks to uh, JD and, and Valerie for putting it together. Oh. And also, look, we're, we're, we're on a journey here. And if anyone's got any questions or queries, all the panelists are, are more than happy to take those questions offline or follow-up. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. David? Yes, again, to uh, re-echo thanks to JD and Valerie for, for putting this all together. Um, and to uh, hope that we can work together with some of the people out there who are looking to put together a VCC within the next 12 months um, and complete this part of uh, the jigsaw puzzle uh, as far as Singapore fund management environment is concerned. Yeah. And um, I, I want to thank the audience for spending the time with us and uh, spending the time exploring the subject together with us. Uh, I mean, your questions will probably probe us to think further about how, how best or how better to do this as well. Uh, and I guess I'm uh, very glad the VCC has come home, like I shared with you at the beginning, when I went all the way to Luxembourg to set up CCAF 12 years ago. So with that, thank you, everyone. Have a lovely day and stay healthy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.